First Chronicles chapter 12, and uh, I want to start verse uh, 20, uh, 23, and I want to read through verse 33. I want to talk about where to find mighty men, where to find mighty men, First Chronicles 12, and uh, Let's go to verse uh, 23. And there are, were, and uh, these are the numbers of the bands that were ready armed for war and came to David in Hebron to turn uh, the kingdom of Saul to him according to the word of the Lord. And the children of Judah that bear shield and spear were 6,800 ready armed for war. And of the children of Simeon, mighty men of valor for the war, 7,100. Again, First uh, Chronicles chapter, uh, First Chronicles chapter. 12 here. Of the children of Levi, 4,600. And Jehoiada was a leader of the uh, Ararites, uh, and with him were 3,700. And Zadok, the young man of mighty, val mighty valor, and of his father's house, 20 and two captains. And of the children of Benjamin, uh, the kindred of Saul, uh, 3,000, for hitherto the greatest part of them had kept uh, the war to the house of Saul, and of the children of Ephraim, 20,800 mighty men of valor, famous throughout the house of their fathers, and of the half-tribe of Manasseh, 18,000, which were expressed by name to come to make David king, and the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times to know uh, what Israel to do. The heads of them were 200, and uh, their brethren, which uh, or were of their commandment. Of Zebulun, on um, uh, such uh, as went forth to battle, expert in war, with all instruments of war, 50,000 which could keep rank, that they were not of a double heart. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, the word of God's wonderful, Lord. It gives us so many things for ourselves, for our us and our own personal battles, for principles of life and things we can know what to do and what we're seeing and other things, Lord. And tonight, Lord, as we can just see ourselves. Maybe we can see ourselves becoming mighty men and women and uh, as are talked about uh, here in the scriptures, Lord. And I pray we'd, uh, we would get these scriptures and we'd just see what you have to say to us. And your spirit would certainly be in control and, and uh, Lord, undo messes that have been done in our minds to uh, our potential and the opportunities we have. And and uh, speak to us now, Father. We pray for your light to shine, Father, tonight in this service, into this room, uh, right here upon this pulpit, and uh, and just that uh, uh, you're, we would be quickened according to your word. We pray for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, this, David is uh, kind of finally becoming the king of Israel completely. He had just conquered Jerusalem, and, and uh, he had, uh, he had more mighty men come to him, more people from all of Israel, kind of the last group. And uh, they came to him in three different groups. They first came to him at a cave called Adullam, and uh, that's where his first group of people came to him and uh, and followed him when he was uh, running from uh, Saul. And so that was his first group, and that was about 400. Later at Ziklag, where he got a city uh, more at the Philistines in their land, uh, more people came to him, and he got a bigger crowd and, and, and family. And, and things together with him and just kind of wandering around for those years running from Saul um, uh, and then eventually when he got established in Ziklag he had more people come to him and then this, this third time after Saul's death at Hebron and then he got more people to come to him of course he uh, he did have battles to fight and uh, they fought the Philistines and were very victorious David had a victorious uh, life a victorious uh, uh, as king uh, great victories he never fought Saul who tried to kill him but he fought many enemies and uh, with Saul when he was uh, working with Saul and then later on as king he fought many battles and was very victorious and uh, and also with the Philistines for when he was uh, running from Saul and he was with the Philistines for a while he fought some there and he had many many battles and many victories uh, with these mighty men these men were incredible they were the greatest soldiers in the world I think they were uh, supernaturally blessed to help David because David is such an important Bible character <clears throat> I think 
when you put it all together um, and and uh, the referencing, you probably find David is talked about more in the Bible than any other person except for God, probably uh, uh, more than uh, Paul or anybody else, um, because David starts um, way back in the Old Testament. You think about David, his throne is what Jesus sits on. Uh, Jesus, way in Revelation, is saying, I hold the keys of David. And, uh, and David is mentioned all throughout. He's talked about an acts. He's talked about all over the place. And he's, he, 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 and, and, and Jesus is, is a descendant of David on that side. And so it's all very important. He's very important. And uh, what he does is very important. And he has these mighty men that really helped it so he could get the victory. And uh, they were amazing men and supernatural men, really incredible. Just, to, just in, 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 in this area of scripture, if you just go back just a little bit to chapter, uh, chapter 11 here, it talks about just some of his, the mightiest men. He had three guys who were his three toughest, three chiefs of all the mighty men. And they're called David's mighty men, um, uh, his soldiers who fought with him. Uh, they went into battles out, outnumbered. It didn't matter. Um, just like David killing Goliath, they did these supernatural things and, and were mighty and... <clears throat> And we're talked about it in, in, in chapter 11, verse 11. It says, and uh, this is the number of the mighty men whom David had, a uh, Jesobim, a Hakamite, the chief of the captains. He lifted his spear against 300 uh, uh, slain by him one, uh, at one time. I just do think about that for a sec. At one time with a spear, he killed 300 people. Well, how hard that would be. Okay, they can come to you from any direction. They can shoot you with bows and arrows. They can throw spears at you. They can all run at once. And at one time, he killed 300 people. Okay. And, uh, and, and, and so forth. There's many stories of these mighty men and the things that they did and, and, and how strong they were. And his three toughest guys were, were, uh, were just amazing men that, that, that they're, they're the chiefest of them all. And the toughest of them, one of them killed a thousand. <laughs> Okay, um, in one battle, and uh, and 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 that would be hard to do if you had a gun and they all had swords, and you had a thousand rounds. It'd still be hard to do. And, uh, and, and, and it's an amazing, amazing thing. The, these men were, were mighty. And, and, and it goes on, it talks about exploits they did and, and people they killed and battles they fought and how they, they three of them one time just for David asked for some water. And they went and cut their way through an army, three of them, and cut their way through the army, got the water and brought it back to David without spilling it. That's just as impressive as killing all the people and uh, and not drinking it when you're that thirsty too. And uh, and uh, David will be back. I would drink it and go back again. And uh, but um, but it was these men are amazing. Where did he find these mighty men? And 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 how do you get men like this? <clears throat> And, and it did so much and helped him. Uh, I think it was 800 Adino slay, uh, slew at one time, not 1,000, 800. Uh, in 1 Samuel 23, it gives a list of all the mighty deeds and, 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 and the fights that they, they did and things like that. And, and this list continues on the mighty men that came to him and, and things. I just want to talk about where do we find mighty men? Where does God's army, where, do, where does God's people find mighty men and mighty women who can go and destroy the enemy? Satan and his crowd and, and, and I'm not talking about killing people. I'm talking about seeing souls saved and impacting lives and bringing revival and, and starting churches and, and starting ministries and, and lifting the fallen and, and, and helping people and, and doing mighty deeds for God. Where do we get mighty Christians again? Because there used to be mighty Christians. When I was first saved, I met a pretty good amount of them uh, and they're a lot more common nowadays. There are very few in America. But I've met him. I've met him in other overseas more than I meet him here. Those mighty Christians. Don't you want to get to heaven and not just be another run of the mill Christian? Don't you want to be a mighty slayer of demons and devils and do something big for God? Where do you find these mighty people? Where do you find them in churches? Where do they get the, the laymen who go out and, and help build mighty churches for God? I remember uh, uh, back uh, where I went to Bible college, the church became the biggest church in America, and, and it was huge. And just the, the old saints used to meet there. 
one lady, her kids all grew up and, 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 and uh, she didn't have the health, but all she wanted to do was win souls to Christ. I remember just listen to her, the pastor talk about how all she did all day, she just rode public buses because she couldn't walk around and she just witnessed everybody in the bus. She just said, sit down, witness this person, move over to this seat, witness this person. And her, her day consisted of, her kids were growing up, is riding the public bus and witnessing everybody. People who bring converts to church and win folks to Christ and are, are helping people and making a difference. And, and not just, and I understand that the church program is important and, and when we do that, but look, we're not with you all week long. You, you need to go be a, you got God with you all week. Greater is he that is in you, not he that is in church. Okay. And, and become mighty for God. And I want you to be that. And I want, I want, I want you to make me look like a deadbeat. Because you're such a great soul and you have so much zeal for God. You're doing such great things. You're getting such prayers answered. You're having revival in your family. Your neighborhood's getting saved. You're, you're, you're just, you're doing something for God. And it can be a lot of things, but we want to be mighty for God. And uh, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things, which thou knowest not. Where do we find those uh, uh, mighty, mighty men uh, that, that David had? Let's go back um, to 1 Samuel 22, when David begins leading and finding mighty men. Where did you recruit? them but as you go to the uh, great <clears throat> uh, places where they train soldiers where does he find them you find them from hurting troubled people <laughs> you find them from hurting troubled people first Samuel 22 here it, these guys we just the mightiest are found right here Okay, the ones you read about later are great, but the mighty ones that slew hundreds at a time and all those go, those guys who's, who, who did the supernatural things, they're found right here. First Samuel chapter 22 and verse one, David therefore departed thence, he's running um, from Saul to the cave Adullam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And everyone that was in distress and everyone that was in debt and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them. And they're with him about 400 men. Now we can turn to the passages and show you that these mighty ones, it says these are the ones who came to him at Adullam. Well, that's not the list you'd expect. It should have said everyone who is, the, who, is the, who is so tough that nobody could tame them. The ones who were so strong and so talented that the king uh, was jealous of them. No. It said everyone in distress, everyone in debt. Tell me, say, man, I qualify. Uh, and, uh, and, and everyone in debt. <clears throat> Everyone in trouble, everyone that was in distress, everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented, gather themselves unto him. Now, David could have sat there and said, oh, this is a great army. You're running from your debts. You're upset. You're discontent. You're distressed. You're troubled in your soul. And, and they all gather themselves to follow me. I'm the king of the misfits. <laughs> and my throne is, uh, is sitting against the wall in a cave. <clears throat> but he had greatness around him. Because these are troubled people. And they found someone who cared about them and led them and loved them and trained them and taught them. And they are amazing people. You know, you'd be surprised how often in the cause of Christ, the, the, the troubled and the misfits and the messed up are the people who do the great things for God. And the reason that is, is the biggest reason is, is because they give themselves wholly to a cause. Because they're so appreciative that David would take them. See, many times the people who do the most for God are ones who come to Christ later in life. It's amazing how many great preachers, how many earth-moving missionaries didn't get saved as a six-year-old kid, but got saved later in life, but they knew what they got. Or they drifted from God and came back to God and said, this is, I am giving myself wholly to this thing. They appreciated the opportunity to do something great again. They appreciated a fresh start. That first generation of saying, this is awesome. And look at this. We have a king. And you know what? 
we're in a cave and he's running for his life and we're running for years and years and years, you know what? That king accepted me. The other king thought I was nothing. And when somebody goes to God and says, if God will take me, I'll give my life totally to him. God can make them mighty men. You might be unpopular. You might not be the most gifted. You might mess things up. You might have a bad background. You might have troubles. You might have failed. Listen, when you finally decide to give yourself to the king, the king can make you a mighty man. A king can make you a mighty man. <clears throat> but you got to be realized the opportunity and give yourself wholly to him. And that's what David found. I'm in my home church, I, I just looked at really the years when it grew and thrived the most. The people who came into there, uh, the people who were being saved were people who were just messes, whose marriages are falling apart, who were drug addicts and came to Christ. People who, who messed up their lives and they found a place to serve God and a purpose and a life to live for God. And they began to do great works, became the leaders in the church and assistant pastors and other people. And I include myself, who everybody would have looked at. And most churches would have been patient with me because I was, I was so spirited and so strong willed and, 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 and pastor white and both of us, we were so intense and, 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 and goofy and messed up and everything. And we were, we were trouble. Not because we wanted to be trouble. We just didn't know how to act at church. And we just wanted to do something big. And we just, we just made mistakes. But the pastor was patient with us. And he let us become mighty. And he let us start leading. He gave us ministries for whatever reason. And, 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 and you know, we loved it. And gave ourselves wholly to it. It's the ones who are worried about their pride and looking cool and, and their dignity and how incredible they are and how gifted they are and how talented they are that don't want to look be a misfit in any way for God. But the Bible says the things of God are foolishness to the world. And look, they can be nuts tonight watching their football game and they can be nuts playing football and they can get themselves told of those things and everything's normal. But you give yourself totally to God, you're crazy. That's what they say. They can get themselves their beer. They can get themselves the money. They can get themselves their morality and partying and, and, and music of whatever sort they want. They can get themselves totally over to, over to politics or whatever. And they're just, they're just uh, excited people and having fun. You give yourself totally to God, you're an extremist. But I want to say, look, when you really realize your opportunity, it doesn't matter how messed up you've been, how, how much you think you're not a good candidate. <laughs> you're going to be people, you're going to be the ones they're writing books about. And you don't have to have the, all the training, all the background, all the perfection. You just have to go give yourself to the king and say, you know what? I'm, I, I, I am in trouble, but this is where I'm accepted. And that's here at church. <clears throat> that's in God's house. That's in God's will. That's in God's kingdom and doing the work of God and giving yourself wholly to it. Yes, sir. It used to be so often uh, in ministry we would have, <clears throat> and everything's changed. Our society has changed so much in about five to seven years, I would say. Ministry has changed, how you do ministry. And I want to say this, it was fairly constant with a slight decrease in, in our culture for for the first almost 30 years of serving God. Something has happened to people. Um, uh, it, it used to be when you help somebody and deliver them um, by through God's power, by God's grace, from their messed up life, from the power of sin, or from their struggles, they got God. And they came to your church and they stuck with it. And they were your most loyal members because they appreciated what you did for them and what God used the church to do. And that was their church and they were going to stick with it. Nowadays, I want to say you can take the distress and all them and you can help them and give them a start. But unfortunately, a lot of them, they just want out of trouble. They don't want a new start. They are happy you got them out of trouble so they can start their process of getting in trouble again. I remember I had a guy come here and, and he was, this guy had been saved a teenager and done, and had a, had a good life for a while. And then he got away from God, messed up his life. It was all a mess. And he was a really mess. And he came in here and we got him and helped him for a few days and, and did some things, gave him some work. And I, I worked him and, and 
and uh, for you know just about two weeks time and he came to church and 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 uh, and, and got him back on his feet and just helped him out and you know we do that stuff all the time it's, it's just you know we love people and we're in the area you know and that's fine and he was a troubled guy and 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 the last time I, I dropped him off and we put him in a hotel because he earned it and and I said you know just to tell you most people we do this too we never see again and he says, look, God's been speaking to me. I am, I am so, I appreciate so much all the effort you put into us. And he says, I am not going to be one of those ones who disappear and don't come back. And I saw him about nine months later. And he was parked in a, one of these messed up, dilapidated motorhomes in our parking lot. And I ran across him. He says, you know what? You told me that most people you help, you never see them again. And I did that to you, didn't I? I said, yep. He said, I'm not going to do that. I'm coming back. That was about four months ago. I haven't seen him. We didn't help him this time, though. You know what? If God's given you a chance to serve him and given you a place where you're accepted and loved, you need to just give yourself and become a mighty man in that place. Yes. You'd be surprised what you can become when you give yourself to a cause. Look, we have, I, I just, I just, I just look at what some of you have become and are becoming. And it's amazing. And, 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 and <clears throat> look, we got mighty men here, mighty women. And it's great and it's wonderful. But you know what? We need more mighty men and mighty women. We got to, we, we're just, we've got a lot of, uh, we got a lot of fighting to do here. Yeah. In this area. Yes. There's just too many enemies, too many devils, too many demons, too many lost souls that we've got to go fight for and win and do the work of God and help people. And I can't do it all. You've got to do it. You've got to do it. You got to become mighty, and 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 praise God. Taylor just came back in the Philippines, uh, becoming a mighty woman, laboring there, and that's not what she expected to be two years ago, a missionary. But you know what? You give yourself to the cause and dive in. You find you're doing great things. And it's fun to do great things. It's so much better to go and step out and see God use you and, and do a bunch of great things. And all of a sudden, you stand around and you look around and say, hey, there's nobody else here. That's a lot of bodies. Everybody, all the other soldiers standing around going, you just killed 300. You just killed 800. Whoa, that wasn't me. That was God. Or you could be a soldier who... Missing a couple bow shots and then got knocked in the head and fell asleep, you know, knocked out for the rest of the fight. And tell your grandkids about that. Be a mighty, do something big for God. You got a big God. You know what? He can take the distressed and the troubled and the debt and all the, the messed up people and he can use you. That's where David found him. That's where David found him. Because the needy people know what they get when they get God and they love serving God afterward. Amen. They love serving God. I could name names. I could talk about that. We could see these things and people we've seen. It's great. Jesus asked, where are the other nine? Not everybody appreciates it, but some people will go and serve God and keep on going, and they'll be uh, a servants of God the rest of their life. And sometimes misfits of fishermen become mighty prophets of God who write scripture. Number one, you find your mighty men in troubled, hurting people. So don't be afraid to go work with hurting, troubled people and bring them to Christ and bring them to church and let them start becoming mighty men. Number two, people who step up. Let's go back to our uh, near our text. First, uh, First Chronicles chapter 11. People who step up. This is so simple. <laughs> The great university of training of mighty soldiers here. One, we found troubled people who had a lot of troubles and distressed people. Number two, we find people who step up. 
First Chronicles chapter 11. <clears throat> We're talking about these mighty men here. And verse, uh, verse 10, <clears throat> it starts listing the three mightiest. In verse 11, this is the number of the mighty men that David had, uh, Jehoshabim and uh, uh, Hakonite, uh, the chief of the captains. He lifted up a spear against uh, 300 slain uh, by him at one time. And after him was Eliezer, First Chronicles chapter 11 and uh, verse 12. And after him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo. See, you can turn out right even if your dad's name's Dodo. And, uh, and the Ahoite, um, uh, uh, not he'd be a victim and he'd have a bad rest of his life because he grew up with that, that stigma and so now the rest of his life he's, he's going to be messed up but uh, they didn't have safe zones then either. Um, the Aho the Ahoite who was of, the, of uh, uh, the three mightiest and he was with David at Pash, uh, Pashadim and uh, there the, uh, the Philistines were gathered together to battle uh, where was a parcel of ground full of barley and the people fled from before the Philistines. So David's there at battle, and they're in the middle of battle, and, and the Philistines really started winning, and everybody took off, except for the three. And they set themselves in the midst of that parcel, in the middle of that field, and delivered it, and slew the Philistines, and the Lord saved them by a great deliverance. You know what? These are people who, we'll get to it in a minute, they stood their ground. But watch this. <clears throat> If you follow uh, what David Good did, go, watch this chapter 12. We're going to get back to those guys in a second here. And watch verse 30. David goes into Jerusalem later with his soldiers. And he, and he, and he, and he makes it into the city of David, the, 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 the part of, of Jerusalem. And it says in verse 29, And of the children of Benjamin, uh, the kinder of Saul, uh, 3,000... Oh, I'm sorry, i got to go back to, uh, um, to chapter 11. Sorry, I'm in the right spot on the page. Wrong verse. Chapter 11. And verse 8, and it says, The inhabitants of, uh, of Jabus uh, said unto David, Thou shalt not come, uh, come thither. Nevertheless, uh, David um, took the castle of Zion, which is the city of David. And David said, Whosoever smiteth the Jebusites first shall be chief and captain. So Joab, the son of uh, Zeruiah, this is uh, chapter 11, 1 Chronicles chapter 11, I'm in verse 6, uh, went first up and was chief. And David dwelt in the castle. Therefore, they called it the city of David. And he built the city roundabout, even from Milo roundabout. And uh, Joab uh, repaired the rest of the city. So David waxed greater and greater, and the city of hosts uh, was with him. The Lord of hosts was with him. David says there, David said, okay, whoever wants to be a chief, let him go up and take the rest of the city. So he's in Zion, part of Jerusalem. He says, and they're fighting against the, the people, the inhabitants of Jerusalem. He says, whoever wants to be chief, go up and fight against them. And whoever smiteth the Jebusite shall be chief of the captain. So Joab, the son of Zerurite, one of his mighty men. David said, whoever wants to be, go. And Joab said, I'll go. I'll go. He volunteered. I want to say leaders lead. They don't wait for a title or a position. True. <laughs> I talked to a pastor and he was, uh, we, were, we were talking about men uh, coming uh, to the Northwest and talking about trying to get people to start churches and assistant pastors and things like that. And, and this is not where people go very much. And, uh, and he says, the, the man told me, he says, I've called the Bible colleges and I've tried to recruit them. He says, look, everybody wants a position. Few people want to go get a ministry. Everybody wants a position. Everybody wants a title. I, uh, we were hiring, uh, we were hiring, looking at hiring an assistant pastor years back, and in, in that process, uh, one of the one of the pastors who's you know, the young man uh, wanted to come here and work with us, and the pastor said to me, he said, "Look, do you have an office for him?" I said, "No, I don't have an office." He says, "Well, he's not coming unless he gets an office." I didn't have an office for 18 years. My office was my car, okay, and and that was my office. <clears throat> Because everybody wants a position. You know what? Just go slay the enemy. Yeah. 
<laughs> don't worry about your title. Who, has, who, who, who looks up to you? Who calls you anything? Who get, who get, who, what position? Pastor, how are you going to honor me? What's my position? You know what? I, I don't get paid to do the ministry. No, you're a Christian. <laughs> you're a Christian. And Christians should just step up and go do things for God. You're saved. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you. Look, if I would have started... <clears throat> Uh, serving God and winning souls and helping people. When I became a pastor, I would have wasted 12 years of ministry. But I had 12 uh, wonderful years of ministry before I became a pastor of serving God. And it's not about titles. Just step up and go do what needs done. You don't have to have a position if somebody's hungry to feed them. I'm sorry, you're starving, but you know what? I'm not a pastor. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Go help somebody. Step up. Look, find a need. You see somebody who's lost? Go up and witness to them. Can I do that, pastor? Yes. You have my permission. Give <laughs> the Bible's permission and command, okay? Just, just step up. Yeah. Fill needs. Help people. That's where you get mighty men. Number three. <clears throat> Where do you get mighty men from? From those who have one heart. <clears throat> from those who have one heart. Let's go to chapter 12 here. <clears throat> from those who have one heart. What do you mean by that, Pastor? First Chronicles and chapter 12 and verse 30. And children of Ephraim, 20,800, mighty men of valor, famous uh, throughout the house of their fathers. And of the half tribe of Manasseh, 18,000, which were expressed by name to come to make David king. And of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times and know what Israel to do. The heads of them were 200 and all their brethren, which were uh, at their commandment, of Zebulon, such as went forth to battle, expert in war, with all instruments of war, 50,000, which could keep rank, they were not of a double heart. They could keep rank, they were not of a double heart. <laughs> I look up, uh, I, I studied in the Hebrew a little bit, This, this where, where did that term uh, come from, and, and how did God phrase it? Uh, they were not of a double heart. The, literally, what it says there, um, it's, in the Hebrew, it just goes and it says, they were not heart heart. It just says the word heart twice. <laughs> And, 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 and the way you translate it is that a double heart. And the way in Hebrew you would say it is they were, if you look at the, the, the way the words are constructed, it says they were without a heart and a heart. They're without a heart and a heart. They had one heart. It was given toward one thing. I was, as I was studying this, I was looking at, they, they talk about a guy who had a heart attack and they, they, they were, his heart was just blown to bits, and, but they kept him alive and they were able to get him a second heart and he had a heart attack on that heart too. I'm sorry, time to finish that guy. If he has two heart attacks in one day, just, you know, on two different hearts. And, uh, but, uh, but you look and you, you go, that's not funny, I guess, is it? And, uh, and, uh, but, uh, but uh, this, their heart was one direction. Their heart was stable. Their heart was not a double heart that was going different directions. Look at verse uh, 38. All these uh, were men of war who could keep uh, rank, came out with a perfect heart to Hebron to make David king over all Israel. And the rest also of Israel were of one heart to make David king. There's that one heart. One heart. We see this. Can you imagine a battle? <clears throat> this is always true. <clears throat> If, you, if you're in a battle, here's thousands of enemies coming at you, and you're thinking, I don't know if they're the right right or we're right. Maybe they're the right ones. Maybe we should, we're taking over their land. Maybe we're the bad guys. You're not going to be a good soldier because your heart doesn't put yourself into what you don't really believe in. Well, if you can't decide which arm you want to fight for, you're just going to fight for the one who's winning. Okay, a double heart. A double heart in our lifetime comes from a heart for this world and a heart for God. You have a double heart. You have a double heart. You can't decide. But when you want to find a mighty man, 
Remember we read about that? The field was overtaken by the Philistines. Everybody else ran, but these three said, we're not going anywhere. We're staying right here. We're going to fight. We're not giving up this field. And what happened when they did that? Because they didn't do that? It says the people fled in the end of verse 13, chapter 11, and then verse 12, the end of verse 13, verse 14, and they set themselves in the midst of that parcel. You find mighty men were people who have given themselves totally to a cause and are going to be stable and stick with it and not quit when the going gets tough or are not going to go and not and be, go back and forth in the world and God and, and heaven and earth. They're going to say, I my heart is set on serving God the rest of my life. I have one heart, one choice in my life, one thing I'm going to do with my life. This is what I'm going to do. Let's go to Psalms, look at some Psalms about this. They had one heart. You find mighty men where you find people with one heart that give themselves completely to a cause and say, I'm going to do this thing. You don't have to be all that talented if you give yourself all the way to it. When you half swing at a piece of wood, you usually find all you do is get your axe stuck. When you throw itself, when you uh, swing hard, you break the wood and your axe is still free. Halfway doesn't do anything. Psalm chapter tw uh, 12 and verse 2. They speak vanity, every one with his neighbor, and flattering lips with a double heart do they speak. Psalm 78. You find mighty people with one heart, where you find people whose loyalties aren't divided. Psalm 78 and verse 8. And might not be as their fathers, a stubborn, rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright, whose spirit was not steadfast with God. Verse 37, for their heart was not right with him, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. See, when your heart is not all the way into something, you are not steadfast in your commitment to that thing. <clears throat> You get, when you get married, you give your heart to one person and, 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 and you do not uh, and you keep your heart steadfast to everything. When you go and you decide to go and, and go in the ministry, you serve God with all of your heart and you don't go back. You don't look at the things. You stay committed to it. When you put your heart into things, you're steadfast. You don't move around. You don't move around. You decide you're going to do something, certain job, and it's hard, and you get setbacks, but you're determined, and you just go to the hardware store and buy what you need, and you keep working on it, and it breaks and falls apart. But you decided to build that or fix that, and you keep working on it until it's done. But then other things you just kind of try to do. You ever seen two people who don't want to fight, but end up fighting? And they're kind of halfway kind of slapping and shoving and kind of hoping somebody breaks them up. <laughs> and you know what? I've seen tough people who didn't want to fight get beat up by people who weren't very tough who wanted to fight. Because they threw themselves totally into it. Because you, you put your heart into it. When you put your heart into it, you stick with it and you finish it. And you, and you stay with it. And you become the soldier you need to do. I might be in debt. I might be messed up. But I'm going to become a good soldier. And you know what? Everybody else is running. But I'm going to stay in this field because we are fighting this battle. Steadfast hearts. Psalm 57. Uh, yeah, Psalm 57. You find mighty people where you have steadfast hearts. Psalm 57. The people stick with it. Yes, you're going to mess up. Yes, you're not perfect. Yes, you're going to have hard times. You're going to fail sometimes. But you know what? Your heart is set. Psalm 57, 7. My heart is fixed. Oh, God. <clears throat> My heart is fixed, and I will sing and give praises. Psalm 108. Psalm 108 and verse 1. Oh God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praises even with my glory. Psalm 112. <clears throat> In verse 7, he shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. He's not moved by afflictions because his, his heart is fixed. I'm going to go all the way to the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians in chapter 3. His heart is fixed. So you go through hard times. Things don't turn out like you think. You're surprised. Things are harder than you thought they were going to be. You had troubles and, and mistreatments and, and failures. Okay, but you know what? When your heart's fixed, you're already on that road. And you're not getting off it. First Thessalonians chapter three. <clears throat> Troubles are coming to the church in Thessalonica. 
In verse 3, it says that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed there too. Don't be moved by your affliction. Fix your heart. I said before, I don't know if God's going to have a good Christian, but he's going to have me the rest of his life. <laughs> He will have me, whether that's a good thing to have or not. He's got me. <clears throat> I'm sticking with God. This is the life I'm going to live. This is who I'm going to serve. I decided that, and I said, this is the way. This is the right. This is God. He is good to me, and I'm going to serve him. He's been so good to me. I'm going to serve him the rest of my life. Now, sometimes I've come up short, and sometimes I wasn't a very good servant, but I always said, I'm going to stay in the field. I'm going to keep fighting for God. Because your heart, fix your heart on God. I love where it says they set themselves in that field and they weren't going to be moved. There are people who weren't of two hearts. So David got these people and they could, uh, let's go back to our, to our, our text, First Chronicles and uh, chapter 12. <clears throat> and finish up there in verse, this verse 33. At the end of the verse there, it says 50,000, which could keep rank for they were not of double heart. Why could they stay with it? Because they were not of double heart. They decided they were going to follow and serve David and stick with their mission. And they're going to do it to the end, to the last man. And these people are praised, and that's where David got his mighty men. People who were not of a double heart, they could keep rank. The question is, can you keep rank? Can you stay serving God when it's hard? Can you stay serving God when we have a bad Sunday? Can you keep serving God when I preach a terrible, terrible sermon, which is often? And uh, <clears throat> can you keep that when you become a bad Christian and fail? Wow. And say, you know what? I'm not quitting. A just man falls seven times to rise back up again. I'm getting back up. It's not about me. It's about God. Can you keep rank when things don't go like what you thought they would? Can you keep rank because your heart's not, because not something to go back to? Okay, well, serving God's not working out. Well, let me go back and do this. You have a double heart. You have a hard heart. Hard heart. <laughs> In the hard heart, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, James tells us. So mighty men, troubled people. <coughs> troubled people. <clears throat> mighty men, people with one heart. Okay? Mighty men are people who just make a decision and stick with it. What, what, what are you? Are you a mighty man? I mean, he said, mighty men come from people who step up. They didn't look like that when they're in a cave. David looked around and said, huh, okay, that's, I got some bodies between me and Saul. That's good. Maybe I can run while Saul chops him up because there's not much here. No. David said, this is what God's given me. Later on, he said, I had the mightiest men in the world with me. They came there messed up, running from something, but they became mighty men.